So uh, bear with me, I'm having my own health crisis in the form of cold. So <laughs> I apologise if my voice gives out. Um, so I'm presenting today on a specific project um, in the context of a wider range of work on sexuality, rights and health that I'm involved in. I'm, I, hear, I work here in the Department of Anthropology as a lecturer part-time, but I also do work on issues around sexuality, health, gender and rights internationally as a consultant and so forth. And this, this presentation is with um, Eric Harper, who's over here, if you raise your hand, who's from the um, African Sex Workers Alliance. He'll be talking a little, about, a little bit about the work of as well, the African Sex Workers Alliance later, and we'll interrupt or chip in, perhaps, in this presentation if some kind of key burning issue arises that I have missed out. So the, the, the project that I want to present on is was a project that was funded and commissioned by the, the UNFPA, uh, and it was about young people and sex and survival strategy in Africa. Eric and I were uh, devised the research methodology and involved in coordinating and implementing it. But it's very much a, a team effort. Here are some of the regional coordinators from, from, the, uh, from ASWA. There was a much larger research team involving young people as co-researchers as, and as people who were also participants in the research. Um, this, this particular picture was taken at the recent ICASA conference in Ethiopia, where the young people were involved in presenting the, the research and its findings in the form of a drama. So there was a, 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 a strong emphasis on a range of methods, including creative, creative methods, which involved the young people as active participants. So background, um, we wanted to learn more about the experiences of young people below the age of 18 in this instance, who sell or exchange sex of work or as a livelihood strategy. And we were concerned that these are you know, poorly understood these people's living practices. You know, there's not much research. It's, it's a, in many ways, a taboo topic which falls between many kinds of gaps. So often, these young people are not included within sex work interventions because it's difficult to include young people within uh, funded programs on sex work. And often, issues around sex and certainly commercial sex are not adequately addressed in youth work and interventions for young people. There are lots of social taboos related to sexuality of young people, poorly researched and poorly addressed by policy and health promotion. At the same time, research indicates that involving young people in the fight against HIV is vital for long-term efficacy. So it's important to involve young people in ways which make sense to them and which have an impact now and for the future. So we took a number of exploratory approaches in, in the present research. So for example, as, I, as noted, the research took place in four countries, so there are research teams in four countries. Um, in Kenya, we had uh, two main research sites, Nairobi and Mombasa, and there were sites in Namibia, Nigeria, and Mozambique. And in each of these sites, there were teams of how many people, Eric, would you say? Each of the teams. In, how many? Four. Four team coordinators in, in this, and more young, more people involved as actual researchers. Uh, and there was a mixture of methodologies, and there was a, there was, there was, I think there was a sort of tension, an unresolved tension, which unfolded somewhat in the course of this project during, during the research process. So there's actually kind of a, quite a, a, a learning exercise that took place during the project. So part of it was just um, involved methods which involved in, in-depth discussion, stroke interviews with young people under 18 who were involved in selling or exchanging sex as a livelihood strategy. Uh, there are mapping activities, learning more about the context within this kind of work took place from the point of view of young people themselves. There was the creative group work activities, which Eric was much more involved in facilitating. Uh, these were workshops with young people from each of these countries during which they were used drama, other forms, of, other forms of illustration to represent and think about their lives and, uh, and build alliances with each other. That was a very important part of it. And there were size estimation activities, which were also a very key part of the UNFPA agenda, uh, using contact with contact methods, uh, other kind of size estimation activities in country, because there was, a, there was a keenness to learn more about, well, how many young people are involved in selling sex in each of these sites. I thought that was quite a redundant question in some sense, because it's well, how long is a piece of string. In some sense, it was kind of, it's, it really, there's an infinite number of many, many, many young people who are involved in exchanging sex, you know what I mean, and it's not all labelled discreetly as sex work or a, a, a very defined category. So 
I think this was a difficult thing to achieve conceptually and also methodologically because we, there was also a strong emphasis on involving the young people as the researchers and the kind. I think what became apparent is that the research structure in country was we were asking too much of them to try and pull up all of these things. So I think that was a, that was an important thing to learn. We learned ever such a lot, and there was a real depth and richness to the data. But I think it was a it was a very complicated process, you know. And were, in a way, there were too many agendas coming into the, the research design. This is just one of the um, going on to what just this here, what, yeah, what did we find out? Um, well, this is one just one instance <coughs> when one of the young people is just math mapping aside. These are one of the ways in which we used uh, creative illustration and then use that in a, sort of, as a way to sort of seg into sort of size estimation activities. So people sort of drew the context and explored visually the context that was safe or dangerous or could be both at the same time. So here I think we have a police officer who is both an agent of both safety and danger depending on your particular encounter. So we use these kinds of uh, methods as entry points into discussing well, what are your experiences, and how do they how do they take place in different spatial and temporal contexts? So, one of the key uh, findings of the research was to sort of trouble this idea of a, a young person's transition into into something called that might be called sex work. That's something that you sort of find in some of the literature and some of the policy documents. That was a sort of motivating concern of, of the research when it was commissioned for us to do is to find out how do young people get into selling sex how do they, or how do they become sex workers per se. But of course really what happens is a, is a range of complex scenarios which aren't really about transiting in a very linear way into, into becoming someone who sells sex. Most of the people that we are working with are young people either living on the streets or from fractured poor communities and families who had a whole range of ways of making a living and surviving, one of which might have been selling sex, might have been uh, amongst many other kinds of strategies. Really, you're looking here in, in, in the instance of the work that you were doing, poor, disenfranchised young people uh, who are exposed to violence in a multiplicity of ways, some of which is sexual. And, and also, uh, there was also an important point that um, it was an important survival strategy within these contexts. Selling sex as a way of getting money, getting protection, and so on and so forth. We'll say more about later. So if you see here, there's a couple of quotes. My father had sex with me from when I was a child. If I would, he would put me outside the house. Now I'm at school, and my friend told me places to sell sex. I could buy school books that way, and to be on the corner from Mombasa. If I go out at night, sometimes I have sex with money. Sometimes I like it, sometimes not, to demand it by them. I look after my younger brother, pay for his clothes at school. We were alone, the young man from Nairobi. So it's very much about young people who have a whole range of very uh, onerous adult financial responsibilities from a very young age. And lack of education, lack of other work opportunities, sex becomes one way of living. As we know, many young people in Africa, as elsewhere, often work from a very young age in a multiplicity of occupations and trade, labor, trade, agriculture, domestic work. And that work has a very close and symbiotic relationship with the emergence of a sense of self and identity, as does the emergence of a sense of sexualness and the emergence of a sense of through sexual practice. So there's a strong and close, intimate rehearsing of work, sex, sexuality, a sense of self, which is very much a part of uh, these young, young people's sense of who they were, you know what I mean? So it's, it, again, it's, it's not that you can sort of like take sex, selling sex in or out of the mix of the person. The person is conceived and subjectively understands self in the context of growing up as someone who's been selling sex from a very, very young age. So there's a very close, intimate relationship. And, and, then, and of course, in that context, many of the young people don't know any different. That, that, that their sense of self is so bound up with uh, exchanging sex on often a daily basis or very frequent basis that again sort of trying to look at just sort of separating these things out doesn't really make any sense at all. I went to the beach often when I was younger, I would meet men and uh, they would buy me a drink, I learned about sex. So I began to do this more often and I like it. I found out about my HIV positive status I think from one of the men. So again, you know, 
many of the, they like, many of the young people said that they liked selling sex. It was something that they enjoyed. It was a way of getting affection, protection. And it was so intimately related to their sense of being in the world that it was just the way they were. And then, of course, often they could also reflect on the terrible things that happened in the context of sex as well, such as crying HIV. So in this context, in many, there was a, a strong correlation between the young people growing up fast and being very young. And that was a very palpable feeling, I think, Eric, from how old and young the people were at the same time. Immense responsibilities, a real, you have to grow up fast to survive in the kind of environments that many of these people are, are living. And yet there's a huge lack of kind of emotional development and support, which means that often these young people are very, very emotionally young at the same time as well, engaging in very heightened sexual activities. And of course, um, there's unrequited uh, urges for love, for parental love, for creative transitions from childhood to adult and emotional lives. But further, if selling sex is an emotional act, the young people's value uh, within sex work is attached to their youth. So their commodity value was entirely attached to their, to their, to their youth, to being so young. And yet they managed that by acting in a very kind of adult way in terms of trying to recruit proper clients, what they perceived as a kind of adult way of being emotionally bounded and protected. So there's a, a, a very palpable and troubling tension between um, adult and youth roles in these young people's experiences of the world. And again, this young person, so I, I go to the I know there were old men there, and they looked at young girls. So you know, being very self-aware of these kinds of issues and circumstances. Stigma, um, this is just sort of one of the activities that took place in one of the workshops. People were representing issues around stigma in terms of the different kind of context in which they were constantly stigmatized. And in that context, then often falling between all kinds of different gaps. <coughs> so for example, I had an STD, but when I went to the clinic, they said to me, you, you look like a sex worker, do not come here. Many young people found that it was difficult and impossible to attend adult sexual health HIV testing clinics or to go to pregnancy and maternity services. They would just be expunged and stigmatized. They <coughs> wouldn't bother them. And yet at the same time, sex and sexual health, in all of the contexts that we were working with, were not really addressed in any of the kind of use services that any of these people accessed in any kind of context. Um, and, it was, and of course, in terms of sex, and sex work service precision, there's all kinds of complexities around working with people, anyone who's younger than 18, in terms of um, getting funding and so on and so forth. We just need to promote sex work. So there's a complex uh, range of things, all of which the young people sort of struggle to find any kind of service that should offer any kind of adequate provision or help. And then violence and violation was just such a powerful finding of the research. A common finding was that uh, levels of abuse experienced by young men and women, systematic violence from adults in the lives, obliteration of trust, deliberate authority, rape, etc., was commonplace. I mean, it was just a commonplace finding, again, across all contexts. Many of the people um, had witnessed all kinds of violence in the workshop in Kenya. It was especially noticeable that many of the young people reported having witnessed the murder of a friend, a relative, or neighbours. It wasn't that was not an exceptional thing. That was a kind of common experience living in some of the vast communities there. High levels of alcohol use in the context of sex work is a coping strategy, self medication in adverse lives, uh, because of your risk and strategy for really risky lives, and hunger. And as I say, that they really ate enough. Many of the young people also reported being hungry on a daily basis. So it's just, if you look at this picture, so the young people's view of violence, I mean, this is drawn by how old was this person, Eric? Uh, 13 years old. So 13 year old from Nairobi. So this is just, you know, this is the kinds of things that people are, are witnessing and describing. Again, this is, I mean, it's exceptional and unexceptional at the same time, you know. I mean, many, again, violence and stuff, that people had produced the most extreme imagery of the violence and violation that they suffered in their lives. So, as I said, the mapping activities, in a way, sort of, I think also in the context of the, of the, of the, troubling, emotionally awful, uh, complex states that we've discovered in sort of mapping activities think of it trite in comparison, I think, really. Um, so we had a go at it, and in some sites, in you know, it, it seemed that some of the poorest slum communities, you know, very high percentages of young people were 
reporting experiences of selling sex. It wasn't always that they were being a sex worker, but that sex was one of the things that they had in terms of relationships of protection or care, often with relatives and others in the neighbourhood. And you know, living in communities like that, you know, being exposed to sex from a very young age was, of course, not uncommon. You were living in close, cramped quarters. You hear people having sex, you see your parents having sex, you see your father having lovers or your brother having lovers. You live in environments that by their nature become highly sexualised because they lack privacy. So, um, and of course these are also environments where um, getting by, finding a way to earn a buck is also a constant attribute of everyday life. So this was all kind of in your face all the time, all of this stuff, you know. Um, but it sort of indicates, of course then, in those kind of environments, it's very common. And there are many people that you could map who were exchanging or selling sex in, in some boxes. For example, in, um, we did these contact with contact methods where we tried to estimate numbers of young people met in one bar in one place of one evening and how many, how many of those were we repeatedly contacted, how many new contacts were made. It had mixed, I'm, I'm sure many of you are familiar with those kinds of methods, it had mixed results in this case I mean, because there was a lack of, I think because of the, the way in which the young people lived and we were asking them to do some of this work. Yeah, these people, are young people who had lack of consistency or regularity, and it was quite hard for them to then coordinate and manage these kind of methodologies, which require a certain amount of fixity to be able to go back and forth to the same place constantly. Uh, but for example, on the, on, this, on the 19th of November 2011, 28 young people who were sold sex were contacted. Of these five people were met on previous site visits, and 23 were new contacts. So, I mean, Cumulatively, you can build up a picture from this kind of data of how many new people are, uh, are being met and how. But we don't, I can't say that we have really enough community data on that to make any kind of anything other than kind of provisional estimates of what's going on in terms of the number of people coming in and out of these media which are involved and associated with selling and exchange of sex. Again, in the Puto, there were 348 new contacts made in the within 12 nights within a four week period. I mean, that's a lot, you know, that's a lot of sort of new contacts. So it suggests that there's a, you know, th these are kind of young people who are involved in the social milieu of um, selling and exchanging sex and how many new people can they make, meet who are also doing this, who are unknown to them within relatively short periods of time. And you see, well, that's quite a lot, you know, to come up with, you know. So they give these give some kind of so overall, as, as much of this work, exploratory work was about young people selling sex and survival in the work, work or life, with, the findings indicate that such issues must be understood and responded to in a much broader sense of context in terms of young people and violence, young people and work, young people's sexuality and health, including HIV and pregnancy, the significant service gaps in the young people face, and the very significant need for these data. Really, we don't really know anything about much about these young people, really. We don't really know much about young people violence in much of Africa really. I mean there's, lack, there's a much there's a profound lack of information from the point of view of young people. Yeah, yeah just uh, one of the key things, just in terms of the life expectancy of many of these young people, it's about 40 years of age. So what Paul was talking about earlier on, it's the reality of both being a child and an adult at the same time. It, it, it's a reality for many of these young people, so it's a very different frame of, of reference. Also many of these young people would have fitted into some of the earlier slides like the issue of not having clean water or not eating every mm. day. Mm. And for many of these young people, the very fact of being able to survive, uh, there's a tremendous sense of um, pride in that, mm. their resilience, their ability to actually be able to survive and actually, uh, yeah, so there's a sense of credibility in that. That's the, that's the education, it, to be able to street hustle. Um, just in terms of the violence, I have to say one other thing. Should I go back to that one? No, that's fine. Okay. Just a lot of the violence is actually committed by, committed by uh, uh, authorities. So a lot of the role models in their lives are the yeah. people actually committing violence towards them. We had a number of situations where, or in, in three of the sites, where people had actually been raped or running away from rape, went to a police officer for support, and then the police officer rapes the person again. Um, or they get turned away from the health clinic. They get, oh, you look like a sex worker, off you go. So we have a lot of situations like that. So a lot of the role models who are there to protect these young people are actually the ones perpetrating violence against them, uh, which, is, which is highly problematic. And then just the other thing is, which also makes it highly complex, is that the different sites, we worked in Lagos, 
Abuja, uh, Mombasa, Nairobi, Maputo, um, in, they were vast, and, and um, Vintuk, there were vast variations in the sites. There's lots of commonalities, but there were also variations. Yeah, we did really go into variations. Which, so, so it really gets quite, there's the locality element, there is commonality, but there's lots of complexities. And, and, that's, and that's both uh, true for sex work and young people engaged in survival sex, that there is so much complexity. And um, often these things are, are simplified. That's Thanks, Eric. That's really helpful. And these are just some of the things that we'll, we'll have the afternoon seminars on this. Um, Andrea Cornwall, who's also a professor with anthropology here, will be joining us to broaden the discussion about sex work. Okay. Great. Thanks.